Um, so now, with the growing number of the patients that we're serving, Kai is really focusing on the productivity and geographic expansion. Um, I have seen the life cycle of monoclonal antibody, the mature, um, maturing over the decades. Um, really feeling we are very at, at a very early stage of uh, cell therapy. Um, extremely um, fortunate to be uh, in this space and to grow the industry. Great. So if I can ask our uh, AV guys to switch to the other uh, computer, if you can go to a web browser and go to the website slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com, and it will re redirect you to sli.do. There'll be a place to enter a hashtag, and this is true for our panelists too if you want to pull out your phones. It's very rare that you get to be in front of an audience and use your phone. <laughs> Just type in MESA. It doesn't matter, caps or not caps. Uh, and you should get uh, into uh, a page where you see one tab that says uh, Q&A and another says polls. And so I encourage you to go to the polls, and what you'll see is the opportunity uh, to give us some feedback. And the question we're interested in hearing your thoughts on are what are some of the tr uh, drivers and triggers for innovation when it comes to manufacturing technologies and approaches? And you can enter as many things as you want. You can enter one word. You can do it five times. Um, and if you see something else that you like, you should be able to like it also. And so you can drive, um, you can drive themes up. So if speed's really important, you can start driving it up. And then as we start to get a view on what people are uh, entering, we're just going to wing it and start talking about some of them. And hopefully there'll be some common themes. And hopefully nobody will uh, enter anything particularly offensive. <laughs> I, I've used the tool before and have had that happen uh, in a smaller audience amongst friends. But uh, that always makes it interesting. So I'll, the floor is open for any of our panelists. If you see something you want to just chime in on or talk about, so, uh, or offer your own perspective. Well, happy to get started. If Please, you like. yes. So there are many things that are coming along the lines of COGS uh, driving the technological journey or innovation to kind of increase the scale. In a way, this links to me um, to what have just been mentioned by uh, Estimate Kite, that it's the same journey that we have seen for monoclonal antibodies. We were starting in a place in which we were doing things on uh, um, 2D on surface with a ridiculous titer without uh, any closed system or with a very high risk of infection and incredibly high COGS. And then there is a journey that has been extremely painful and complicated to go through an optimization that took us into considering monoclonal antibodies today a commodity. That's the journey that is going to happen and uh, the innovation is gonna go around at least the three dimension. One is the technical innovation, that is the one that everybody thinks about but then there is one dimension that is around uh, actually industrialization and pure operation and how to do things in a, at scale. And the third one is just working on the input materials and raw materials so that they become adequate for actually an industrial manufacturing. Those are the three things that normally in a big scheme of uh, events are happening and we are observing on all of those already movement today. So innovation is happening, surprisingly. Maybe not fast enough, but probably faster than it happened with monoclonal. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, when you think about uh, lowering COGS uh, in this particular field, are, are there uh, certain aspects of the process where you feel uh, there's a consensus that these would be the target areas to, uh, to create the best opportunities to address the COGS issue? So um, from, from our perspective, we'd say um, you've got to have the titer there to begin with. So it starts with the upstream. If you don't have a good upstream, you're, you're not going to make the process at some, you're not going to make vector somehow in the downstream. So uh, we focused on moving away from uh, a cell factory process for making lentiviral vectors with serum to a 200 liter serum free suspension bioreactor process. And we've seen great increases in productivity per liter uh, but it, it is an end-to-end -end challenge. You, you need to optimize all aspects uh, from upstream to downstream to uh, efficient ways of doing full finish. Uh, but yeah, you, you've got to start at the upstream. You know, for, for me, I, I do, and I think that, you know, building on the idea of, of the transition from upstream to downstream, I also think that, you know, when I take a look at what I see in processes across the industry, you know, you have six processes and you have eight different ways of doing manufacturing, sometimes downstream. 
And so I think the idea of this industrialization journey that we're, we're speaking about, it's really important to also think about you know, standardization along the way and thinking about how we can be leveraging best practices from multiple different um, um, kind of therapeutic approaches to kind of get to this templated process. You know, it, and MABS for me is always the, the prototypical example here in biologics where we took something that was super complex and now you're getting into something that's really well understood and you can legitimately call it a template. And for me, that's one of the huge you know, drivers and needs for innovation in the space. Now, a lot of that, a lot of that in the MAB space was <coughs> almost intentional, right? I think there was a phase where early on, uh, in the early days of the biotech industry, uh, manufacturing processes were just deemed to be very proprietary and there was not a lot of information sharing. But there seemed to have been a phase where uh, people converged on the processes, they established platforms, and, and there was a realization that sharing of certain amounts of knowledge about manufacturing would actually make it easier. And the fact that people kept moving around, frankly, from company to company, there was a natural mixing. Uh, do you think we're going to get there in, in this space sooner or later? I think, I think there's, there's two components here. And I think for, for Viral Vector in particular, we're on the right path because it, it's a little bit of a rehashing of what happened in, in biologics. I think if we go over to the cell therapy space, in particular uh, autologous cell therapy, it's a little bit of a different story. I think there's the, the standardization comes in at a, at a different level, and I think it's more on the equipment level rather than maybe processes um, and, and general approaches. And I think uh, from that perspective, that's where equipment can make up for one of the key cost drivers, which is uh, hands-on time and personnel. Um, which will also make production a lot more robust. Um, and in particular, in the, in the autologous space, I think that's, well, we'll see where it goes, whether the autologous persists or not. But uh, if we look at it from today's perspective, um, automation and, and standardization around equipment um, should hopefully um, have, an, have a big impact. And then I think allogeneic uh, is probably going to go more in the direction of viral and biologics, I think. Um, so just to add on to everybody else's opinion, I think um, you mentioned uh, industrialization required platform approach. So um, first, we're still working in the process of working out the platform approach to the process. Um, so as of today, we're looking at um, viral vector-based uh, gene transduction. Um, and cell expression for autologous therapy, and that's what we have in our hand. Um, so probably the first step is, you know, what do we see as a platform process for that category? Of course, we can go beyond non-viral vect, you know, gene transductions and, and, and onwards. Um, so our challenge right now is scale up uh, autologous therapy with viral vector-based um, cell um, therapy. Um, within that space, um, what we're seeing here is the cost of composition of, uh, uh, is, is different from monoclonal antibody. Uh, we're seeing much higher variable cost, um, which uh, and, and relatively proportionally lower fixed cost, which gives us some opportunities here. Number one is we can stand up manufacturing facility much faster, and we can work on reducing the variable costs such as direct labor cost, such as material cost, such as logistics cost. Um, so when we start looking to each of the dimensions, then we can think about what could be the sol solutions. For Kite, um, we, there are a lot of things that we could do, but not our expertise, right? Such as uh, uh, labor cost, can we um, introduce automation? And we need to work with partners to figure out what automation looks like. And we can close the systems, we can reduce the human error, we can have a better use of our um, workforce. Um, so that's one area. Um, on the material side, um, it's interesting about you know, two, three years ago, the materials we were working on were really laboratory materials, so my medical devices. And as of today, I think there are a lot of progress has been made in the industry, but we do need to have this ecosystem work with the suppliers, how to industrialize the material. That happened at monoclonal antibody in the early years too. 
And then the logistics side, you know, it's courier service, which is very expensive. It's like first, uh, first class airline ticket every shipment, right? And uh, when we, <laughs> so we have to do better uh, with our ex technology as to the digital technology is going to really help us with tracking, traceability, and the real time troubleshooting. So there are a lot of opportunities in those spaces, and and as for as kite, and we're looking to work with our partners and to come up with solutions in those space. I, I want to make sure we address the one comment uh, that uh, is on protein manufacturing as a lower bar relative to cells as drugs as a higher bar, uh, and, and trying to correlate the previous experience in the MAB community with uh, the experience for this community. I, I don't know if anyone wants to add on to what Nina suggested that uh, viral vectors is a, maybe a, a one place to think about uh, a convergence. Um, whereas cells, may be, uh, uh, there may be other issues. Does anyone want to add on to that? Yeah, sure. I, I could say a few words on the on cell therapy side. You know, one of the things when we take a deep look at the autologous workflow is it's a quite a long potential path from starting with the patient material to kind of delivering the, 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 uh, the therapy back to that same patient, given the autologous nature of, of, of CAR-T, at least today. And, you know, that challenges, I think, some of the, the paradigms that we have in terms of how drugs are manufactured and how they're delivered. You know, it, it could be logistics, it, but as well as, you know, centralized manufacture versus decentralized manufacture. And I think that's going to drive a lot of innovation going forward as well. You know, thinking about how um, do we do manufacture closer to the patients when, you, when you're really thinking about the fact that the patient is part of that workflow. So it's really something that needs a lot more thought. Indeed. So. We, we have a second question planned, and I'm looking at this comment about establishing the FDA and other global regulatory agency support. And so uh, if this works properly, I should be able to do this and take us to that next question. And so what we're interested in, so it, it, that comment made me think about uh, what some of the barriers are to innovation. And so uh, with this new uh, question, we're interested in hearing your thoughts about uh, your experiences or your um, your projections on what some of the barriers are uh, to innovation. Money. Uh, and being very practical, uh, somebody's very quick uh, with a very realistic uh, bit of input. We, we certainly welcome all your thoughts. Uh, I don't know if anyone on the panel wants to react to anything that's appearing early on or even a little bit to the, uh, the comment about the FDA and a global regulatory environment as being a, a particular challenge. We had a, um, a workshop uh, at, a, at a different conference around that, and uh, that FDA um, c comment was w came up in a similar manner where um, there was a suggestion that the FDA should mandate certain standards uh, for manufacturing processes, and, and it was very controversially discussed, um, as I'm sure everyone will appreciate. Um, but from that perspective, I think one of the key barriers to innovation from my end, and, and I haven't seen it yet, so maybe I'm, I'm on the wrong path, but it's, it's that drive to the clinic and the, the mandated timelines that are imposed by investors. What I have seen in my time with Lonza, but, but continue to see now is this, when's the right time to bring in a new piece of equipment? We don't have time for this because the investors say we need to have the first patient treated then, and one patient we can always do manually, so we're not gonna think about that now. Um, and we're expected to be bought out uh, after first patient anyway. So that those are, I'm, I'm being deliberately controversial maybe, um, but those are some of the, the kind of thought processes yeah. I have encountered over the last 10 or so years. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyone else want to comment on that from the panel? So maybe at the other end of the product development cycle, as you're approaching, uh, you know, BLA and commercial, um, you know, you, you can't keep on making changes. Uh, so the introduction of innovation is tough at the beginning because people's willingness to pay and take longer in, yeah, to, to get that key risk-reducing clinical data. But then there's the alternative challenge uh, if you've got a product, um, yeah, getting approved. How do you then bring in incremental innovations mm -hmm. which might give you two, 2x, 3x, 5x uh, productivity improvements but if you've got to go to a lot of regulatory agencies, you know, your partner really needs to want to do that. And uh, you know, we've seen it done. It, it can be done, uh, but it, it can't be done every year. It's got to be done in a kind of thoughtful, careful manner. Yeah. You know, it's just kind of building on that thought, you know, one of the things that always strikes me when I think about innovation is uncertainty. 
and the way that uncertainty compounds, right? There's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, individual kind of barriers here that are popping up on the screen, you know, time, cost, you know, benefit. And, and I really think I've started to think about things in terms of ratios, like the benefit versus the risk and the benefit versus the cost and how much you, can you make on it and how many patients can you save if we additionally. But the, the challenge with this, a lot of these decisions are made on, on a kind of these trade-off um, perceptions, but you start to really compound the risk because now you're saying how certain we are in the cost or how certain we are, are we in the benefit. When you kind of take that ratio, you're kind of blowing it up. And so there has to be some getting the people comfortable with saying that for progress to happen, we have to take on a bit more risk. And I think we're, we're seeing that in this industry and it, it just, we have to keep pushing that forward. That's a, that's a good idea, but I also would like to break a little bit the paradigm of uh, big innovation or read it, big advantages comes with big risk because sometimes there are uh, uh, the biggest blockage that came out a little bit from the answer to innovation is a little bit the desire or the, the sense of obligation to doing something completely revolutionary. And uh, it might make sense for a very new product idea, but if I go in fields that are more close to the one that I know in the everyday life, things like basically innovating early on on the raw materials or on the, or on the things that are getting used with a good process development at the beginning, can turn around completely the, um, the benefit, innovating relatively little but with big impact. I give an example. If I observe what happens in the industry and customer process that come in into, into our facilities, sometimes they come in with open processes. These are by now is common knowledge, but for instance, raw material that are not wrapped or single wrapped or are not possible to be HVAC. This basically means that your percentage of failure for sterility failures is gonna just go up structurally. And so you are adding a 20, 30%, 50% to your COGS, plus the risk of having some serious regulatory impact. When at the very beginning, with just a little bit what could call incremental innovation can create a significant benefit. So it's important to have the big ideas uh, that can also have some risk, but sometimes looking also at the very basic uh, innovation and incremental innovation in terms of fixing some of the basic process can go toward the journey we were discussing before. That is just the starting point of setting the good foundation. Some of that comes down to having the right people in the right environment, small companies versus large companies, for example, and their tolerance of risk as I'm looking at, uh, uh, at this list because uh, speed, as was mentioned, is, is really critical uh, in a lot of cases and, and so how does one perceive a small innovation uh, versus a large innovation? Um, uh, somebody's a shareholder uh, in, in maybe Starbucks. Uh, so how does, how does somebody uh, perceive you know, the, the impact on timelines uh, when uh, deciding to try to implement a new uh, innovative approach, whether it's an assay or a technology? Anyone want to uh, comment any further on uh, some of the barriers uh, uh, in terms of the size of the company and risk tolerance. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've talked about inside Nimble is that, uh, as was reflected earlier, uh, the tolerance to uh, putting in an innovative technology into your process is relatively low pre-market because speed is everything. And then, as you reflected, uh, once you get that license, well, now you're in a global environment. And so post-approval changes it's not just about one authority, it's about multiple authorities, and do you really want to do that at that point? This is a slightly different field than uh, what antibodies, as was reflected earlier, in that um, innovations are happening really fast. Do you think that might change uh, people's perspective? Do you think uh, we might see more innovation in the future, in the near term, in, into these processes? I think we will. Um, I think we're, we're at this turning point, um, and I'm probably going a little bit back on what I said earlier, but what, what we're seeing now with some of our customers having a manufacturing technology, so a piece of equipment, they come to us and say, okay, we now need to actually demonstrate that we can make this, right? So the industry, I think, has matured to the point where everyone believes that this can work. Uh, and that it can be a new paradigm in, in medicine and treating patients that are, that are really sick. And so now we're, we're migrating and maturing into the, the question of how, how can we make it. And to your point earlier, I think I see a lot of smaller companies actually willing to now be innovative 
because obviously there's there's already the established players, which were small and are now kind of the the old guys and the established guys. So the younger ones and newer ones that come into this space now need to find better ways and being faster to leapfrog what's there. Um, and so we have seen a lot of the newer players come to us and say, we want to try this new piece of equipment. Um, everyone else is playing with what has been there. Let's try new stuff and find new avenues to maybe surpass what's, what's there. So I think we're right now at that cusp of, of things changing into a more innovative uh, paradigm and, and, and thought process. So you mentioned you were in a meeting where there was a discussion about uh, what it would be like in a world if, if the FDA imposed a standard, which is probably not going to happen uh, anytime soon, but let's, let's do that thought experiment. Do you think if, if, the, if the agency imposed a, a standard on whatever uh, aspect of the process, would that, um, would that ultimately hinder uh, the pace of innovation in processes? Or would that perhaps help because people get aligned and they can identify what the limitations are of those approaches, which might uh, spur new creation of new ideas? I'll just qualify that a little bit. So one of the key points that was made in that workshop was that the, the, the agency should mandate um, a manufacturability standard, right? right? And, and uh, whichever way, there were other points around connectivity between equipment or software standards. So really, like proper technical okay. standards, mm -hmm. rather than uh, maybe quality quality standards or, or, or yeah, CQAs in general around around therapies. So that was it was a very technical discussion, but I think um, it could drive innovation. That's <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> yeah over to others. Any other thoughts? Would, would uh, more clear expectations on certain standards help or hurt innovation in new processes? Well, it, it certainly help, helps if everyone uh, has clarity around what the end point for the product should be. But for me, one of the uh, barriers for innovation is who's going to pay for it? Uh, you know, if, if you're a product developer, do you really want to pay for the manufacturing uh, innovation yourself? Um, does your CDMO want to? Uh, if they're purely driven by financial results, innovation costs. So we're, we have a, a somewhat mixed business model whereby we develop products for ourselves. And through that process over 20 odd years of, of, of success and failure, we've ended up developing a lot of technologies initially for ourselves and innovations that we then share with partners. So it's not that we won't let our partners pay for some innovation, but you know, we, we see that the innovation uh, role sort of starts with us, um, but then that means that uh, you know our margins might not be as big as others in, in the short term, but we think innovation is something that we've got to do and it should have long-term benefits uh, for others. Um, but uh, just the only other reflection I have is innovation is better to come very early on in product development. Uh, if it's an innovation that can make a product realistic and manufacturable, then everyone wants to adopt it. Uh, if you have technologies like that, it's quite difficult to plug them in early enough into the innovation cycle. Because if you can't make something, if, if the uh, academics in top centers can't make something, they will never see the light of day. So there's a, there is a challenge to getting innovation out uh, broadly to a whole community that might actually make some products manufacturable uh, in the first place. Any other comments on that? Um, may maybe I s speak from a different uh, side of, <laughs> of this uh, topic. Um, I, I have actually feeling the industry extremely open to innovation because this is so new. Um, no one really have a perfect solution saying this is the way you do it. And it really takes, uh, the challenge is that, um, a lot of solutions require multidisciplinary consideration and uh, to put the pieces together to say what, what the innovation is going to solve, what the problem. I think it, it define the problem and connect the problem with the technology is the way I think a lot of us spend a lot of energy trying to sort it out. As far as uh, you know, our experience at Kite, you know, Kite was built based upon the technology license from um, National Institution, Institute of Cancer. Um, that was where in, in innovation started. And what we did was industrialize the innovation. 
um, and with a lot of standards <clears throat> out there and tremendous risk taking and tremendous focus to make it a success for the end point was a successful product that serves the patients. And we'll continue to look for innovation um, and to help us solve other problems. Along the way, uh, I think there need to be a recognition that we are in the space that that requires a lot of solutions that we actually don't know how that looks like and that open mind and a continued effort is going to facilitate a tremendous um, uh, you know, impressive results. And um, at least at a kite, that's how I feel that we, at moments we feel like we're graduated in the school student all over again. There's a problem we don't know and how we sit around to solve the problem. Personally, I participated in the launch of ESGAD and regulatory agencies have requirements. Uh, um, tracking traceability, but they don't tell you how to do it. And there is also the uh, cell therapy will make it, but it's using the treatment centers. Um, so you kind of cross the boundary, you know, of uh, what the agency FDA controls and where the practices, uh, the places using the material. So extended our responsibility uh, further beyond what we um, traditionally used to, how we solve that problem, right? So we have to work with the community to solve the problem together. So there, there are a lot of, uh, you know, um, opportunities out there. Um, the, the point is that we're still in the early stage and it's just the transformation right now, uh, looking for, you know, um, technologies and innovation. It, it's just, it's going to continue for a, a little bit while until we have a platform approach. So I, I want to, I, I want to come to a topic that I think I saw float by under barriers of innovation, and, it, and it's related to sort of talent and workforce. And so you know, one of the things that I, I find so interesting and exciting about this field is the level of enthusiasm it has generated from all the people who are involved. It, it's just an, a very exciting time to be uh, involved in this field at such an early stage when the transformative impact of the therapies is clear and the potential is clear, and so there's a lot of activity. On the other hand, there may be uh, a, a lot of challenges in finding talent both from the supplier side or the manufacturer side. Uh, any thoughts or comments about your experiences in trying to recruit uh, people to, to fulfill the positions that you have in your organizations? Easy? Is it hard? Is it, uh, how do you do that? How do you manage? So um, we've, um, we've been working on Lenti for, for quite a while, so we've always had around 100, 150 people. But since 2014, we've had to scale the company quite a lot to uh, increase supply for clinical partners and, and now commercial supply. So we're now at 550, so we've really had to recruit very rapidly in the UK. So having a, a, a core cohort of people who really are deep in, in, in the technology really, really helps. Uh, but I think all the experienced people in cell and gene therapy now have jobs. Uh, if there is anyone <laughs> that doesn't have a job, yeah, please apply. Come, 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 no, no, yeah. no, no, come, come, come to us. Um, so we, we see a lot of people retraining from biologics, from sterile injectables, from vaccines. Uh, it's a very attractive proposition for someone to, to get repurposed, you know, that their careers uh, aligned with cell and gene therapy because then they'll never ever be employed, uh, unemployed a, a, again. Um, but we, we've also had to invest a lot in training, uh, not just technical training, but also management training, uh, because people get promoted up quite quickly. If, if you've been there for two years, you're quite senior, but guess what? You've never actually had management training. So uh, we appointed a chief people officer to the, to the board of the company, just to really emphasize the fact that you can't scale a business, you can't keep quality, you can't keep compliance unless you keep training. So this has been um, a real investment for us. And then comes turnover. You need to keep on paying, paying your, your colleagues pretty well. Otherwise, after one or two years, they'll leave. They'll go to Alonza. They'll go to whoever else is, is nearby. If you're in a cluster, that's good to acquire talent. And it's also a disaster. You can lose talent. So um, I, I, I think you're right. It, it, it's really key. We, we want to grow up to 600 by, by the end of the year, if possible. But 550, we'll have to hire a few more than 50 people to get there. Um, so it, it's a pretty complex, uh, organizational, growing business challenge for us all. That's definitely true, but I also think that if we shift a little bit the way of thinking toward product and toward the real innovation, then, then uh, people more toward manufacturing like uh, us do, is that there are uh, probably in this room people that are really thought leaders. 
and really are thinking about the fundamental biologies and really thinking about how to crack the system of life and what is getting broken in life to treat the diseases that are getting treated. So at the end, if you want, uh, I feel like uh, I'm driving an organization to serve those minds. So it's very nice that we are talking now about all the infrastructure that needs to happen and organization like NONSA need to put in place to allow those brilliant ideas to actually get to market. But we should not forget to make sure that some really disruptive innovation in terms of uh, the inner biology and the, uh, and the most uh, deeper clinical understanding stays. If not, company like uh, Kite or the other ideas that actually are generated in this room will not source. And that type of innovation is a little bit more uh, difficult to, to actually frame. And so it's important, as we have seen, the regulator aspect of the public financing and anyway, some investment from uh, companies uh, not directly in their R&D, but into smaller companies to actually fuel these innovation is at the basis. So if these kind of few hundreds of real minds would not come together, it would not really happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I was going to kind of go to the point that just popped up on exactly. the screen, which was around the idea that for us all to be successful, we all have to have the workforce that is going to be able to support the, the kind of the growth that this industry is going to have. And I know that as industry groups, you know, for example, ARM, we're all here, you know, they have a workforce um, effort undergoing as well to make sure that we are thinking about and, and encouraging communities, particularly where there are um, these hubs, to put in the training programs that are going to support the, you know, there's those entry level bench scientists and manufacturing associates. And so I, I do think this is one where it's very clear need across the industry and, and the, in these kind of um, consortia do really play a big role. And I think just to close that out, the Catapult, for example, in London, they have a very strong traineeship program now um, where you don't necessarily need a university degree because, I mean, I think if we look around the room, a lot of the people, especially on the more scientific technical side, are still almost up to PhD level trainee uh, or, or, or trained up to PhD level. And I think uh, as we become a more uh, mature industry, there will also be lower level and, and more generic roles, but this is not an industry that is known to that part of the population right. or, or, or right. workforce, mm -hmm. right? So I think uh, Catapult is, is one of the spearheads, ARM is, is doing stuff, but mm -hmm. I think it, it obviously, uh, I agree with Jerry, I mean, it needs to be more of an, an industry drive. Great. So we're gonna maybe go to the next uh, question. Uh, which, so this is a, a multiple guess question, and, uh, but you can actually select all that apply. And so in, in preparing for this, we, we thought about kind of the different ways that manufacturing innovations happen uh, within companies. Uh, and so it can happen just because a single manufacturer itself has uh, got to find a solution to a problem. Uh, it can be uh, if you work at a, on the vendor supplier side, uh, obviously you probably spend time in innovation um, and then you, you sometimes have collaborations between uh, two organizations. You sometimes have uh, collaborations with a small number of organizations through a consortia and occasionally uh, through a large scale consortia. So we're interested in, in seeing uh, what approaches to innovation your organization has taken. And as we see those numbers constantly moving and changing, uh, and thank you for your input. Maybe we, I can just ask the, the panelists for their experiences about sort of the limitations and, and the benefits of, of any of these categories, but since a lot have done uh, and tried to do all the innovation internally, uh, maybe just some comments um, you know, about what the benefits and drawbacks of trying to do as much innovation in-house as possible. So um, we, we do a lot of innovation in-house, but we also take part in uh, grant-funded consortia in the UK uh, because uh, that can be a useful way to, to kick-start innovation if, if someone else is partially paying for it. Clearly, uh, you know, ownership of a rising IP and know-how is an important part of any of those contracts. Um, but we, we also look to in-license innovative technologies ourselves, however innovative we think we are. Uh, we'd love to plug in that uh, the best that we can find uh, around conferences like these to, uh, to integrate into uh, uh, ability to deliver better batches 
lower cost of goods, better purity uh, in general. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to do a whole bunch of these. But a really good partnership with, with uh, a, a large uh, uh, company can also be very innovative if it's plugged in right at the beginning. So it takes many years to develop a new process. And if you can find a partner who gives you incentives and because they'll get the long-term benefit of that, then you know, a point-to-point -point partnership can also be very innovative if, if you start off like that on day one. Any other comments about benefits and drawbacks of any of these approaches from experience? It doesn't add up to 100%. It's it does 200. It, <laughs> well, it doesn't add up to 100% because people can enter multiple. Oh, so, okay. uh, so if you have a, you know, an extensive internal innovation program as well as you've partnered with others, uh, uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, I, I think a, the bias generally is to try and innovate internally, right? You, you know, you have, we all have great scientists working for our companies. We, you know, we, we really kind of believe we can push the, the kind of the innovation forward. So I think that's actually a natural place to start, but it also can sometimes be a little bit myopic. You know, there's, there's things that each organization is good at. And so you sometimes end up, you know, like a hammer looking for a nail rather than starting from, from the need. So I'm also a big proponent of, of partnership um, between organizations because then you bring two sides of point of view and it could be, you know, it's listed here two different ways, but it could be a supplier customer relationship or, or it could be to take another form. But I think that kind of bringing that need, the downstream need back into innovation is a really important part. And so I, I you know, I, I think there's definitely a, a real need for that as well. In general, I agree. In general, as an organization, I think it's important, for instance, to go back uh, to the point uh, that was made before, so creating platform. So in terms of innovation, one of the focus that uh, I really feel, uh, at least as long as I, we need to have an obligation to create platform that can be used uh, generally and can be as simple as the way of creating a standardized process or a standardized list of raw materials and application to make sure that there is a good route and path but I call it highway to a safe manufacturing toward commercialization as much as more disruptive idea like uh, um, going in the direction of 3D manufacturing or producer cell lines or uh, cocoon or technology that are kind of a bit of a more of a technical leap. So creating these platforms, it's really important to create, to provide the instruments to then who creates and develops the product on which they can use these uh, um, this infrastructure in a way that is more dependable. Then in terms of innovation is also very important the aspect of the partnering, as it was just said, because uh, it's a good way to actually bring the experience into the specificity of a given process. And by doing that, typically in the stage of a good process development can make a, an, an enormous difference in terms of the endpoint outcome. So both of those two things are important. So collaborative innovation to solve a very specific problem with a relatively short-term impact as much as creating those more infrastructure platform that can be very innovative or disruptive or more, I would say, way of working that anyway prove to be effective are important as almost kind of a package to be easy to be taken and used. So those are the two routes that I really see to be very important. So let me ask the panel, as you see the data as it looks um, in front of you, is there, are you surprised by any of it? And, and the easy answer is no. So then I'll ask, uh, would you expect if we, if we did this exact same poll with the same people uh, seven or eight years from now, where it's a maybe slightly more mature field mm -hmm. uh, in some sense, would you expect anything to be different? I, I think it will be different. I think um, you know, for manufacturing, um, it's really interesting for us to hear that a lot of company, um, companies decided to invest in manufacturing very early <laughs> in, um, in the, the company life cycle. Um, that I never heard about this in the past. Um, I think there are reasons for that because the complexity, the importance, the innovation involved in manufacturing as of today. Yes, we do a lot of internal manufacturing as we mature the technology. And we have internally debated about whether we build more as we expand it geographically or work with partners. And um, at this moment, we think we still need to do it by ourselves. Um, and because the standards and regulatory requirements are still yet to be defined. So um, if we can 
um, continues to we can we can expand by duplicating our knowledge, our practice with the consistency. That is the way as of today. But we do expect this field to evolve very fast. There will be a very um, more practice by leverage, you know, external manufacturing assets and partnership. That that's for manufacturing. But for all the other areas, I think um, it's also expected to see more collaboration um, because um, the players in this field are still a lot of very small organizations. We have very limited resources from lots of panel we just <laughs> heard about. And the companies really need to be focused on what they do well. Um, it's therapeutic products and, and try to cast the um, collaboration as broad as we can to solve other problems so that enable the speed of innovation. Thank you. I think it's also a little bit of a reflection of where we are in the industry. I think we're at the tail end of this, the product is the process and vice versa mm -hmm. period. And that I think is, is still reflected here that people try to keep it in house and, and a bit more proprietary. And I think as we move along, and it becomes a lot more obvious what the key bottlenecks are and the, and the key defined problems, I think that's when it'll open up, become more standardized, and there will be more commoditized solutions, and then collaboration will rise. But equally, I think, it depend on, depends on what level of innovation you look at uh, and collaboration. I think there's small consortia we will continue seeing at, at a, a pretty steady level, because I think they kickstart new stuff. They usually don't really go into product and market ready, but they at least bring in innovation in a, in a, in a collaborative manner, and then it, it will be outsourced into more productization and, and, and next steps. But I think that's, yeah. OK, uh, we're going to go to the next question, uh, which is a, an A or a B, I think. So this one came up on our preparatory phone call that I thought was an interesting question. We'll see who the winner is. Now, there's only one <laughs> responded, so yeah. uh, is more innovation needed in the cell side or the vector side um, uh, of our world? I love all my children. Yes, exactly. Right. This one, I know how it's going to end up. <laughs> yeah. There's a growing contingent of vector people. Continuing to grow. <laughs> they were just slower to get back on the web page. <laughs> I think it goes back a little bit to the comment that was made before of the parallel with monoclonal antibodies, yeah. no? Mm -hmm. So I would almost argue that vector and allogenic cell therapy, eventually, we have a bit of a better idea about how to industrialize them. And it can easily go toward the product that goes to shelf. And then off the shelf distribution is a mechanism of supply chain and business model that is very understood. The benefit of the scale up, so it's very digestible. It's just about executing on that. When you go instead on the, on the, on the autologous aspect, it's really a completely concept, a different model of how to do things. It's almost a concierge approach. You need to put in place this end-to-end -end supply chain. You need to make sure that it's integrated, chain of custody, chain of identity when you had to bother about being sure what your manufacture is for a given person, you would have worried about that after to give the right drug to the right person. So that is a lot of pain that needs to be framed. And also cost structure and, uh, and kind of how to make a decent profitability without making an impossible drug is, uh, is still to be cracked in a decent way. So not surprising. And I think to, to follow on from what Alberto said, it's, it's also dictated by I think there's still a need to understand the, the science a bit more mm -hmm. and the CQA is what makes a good product and, and how, how do we stabilize that and, and, and uh, manufacture that robustly uh, on the cell side. And I think there, that, that is where the difference comes in, that there's still a lot of basic science that needs to happen for us to really understand our products before we can really kickstart um, robust manufacturing. Any other comments on this? So from, from our understanding, uh, there's a larger proportion in the manufacturing cost of goods currently for autologous products in the cell process than there is in the vector. Mm -hmm. um, so while we, we're only working in the vector space, we are innovating. Um, we, we think that there's still a way to go for, for cell, cell processing, but these things are all interrelated. 
you know, that the, that the, the better your vector, the happier your cells, the more viable your cells are. So, you know, I, I think there's innovation needed from all parts of the um, process, from how, how patients engage with large companies to, to get therapies with logistics. Uh, good logistics help good cell processing. Good incoming means good outgoing. So uh, I, I think uh, no one's off the hook here. There's lots of opportunities. <laughs> right. Okay, I, I think we'll go to uh, the next question, which may be the last one. And this is a little bit open-ended, but we, we uh, in thinking about this, you know, we had questions about who, who should be doing innovation, who's doing it. So we, we heard how it's being done, at least from the organizations in the room, uh, based on your responses. Who pays for it? Uh, who should pay for it? Um, I agree. I agree with that, too. Yes. Um, <laughs> right. But I think uh, just to roll fully back on where we started, this industry, I think we all believe in it, and we know it can go a long way. And I, I think there's enough to go around that if everyone contributes, everyone will win, right? And it's on the equipment side for us. It's on the manufacturing side for Alonza. It's on the, the therapeutic uh, revenue streams that will come in for the, the therapy developer developers. So I think it, it is a, a team sport, really. Indeed, I think if you, if you think about trying to converge to some level uh, to try to benefit from some more industrialization, it does require everybody to give their input uh, and to contribute to that uh, process to get there. Uh, if everyone tries to diverge and do their own thing, that could work, but it may not scale very well for the field. It's all about how you frame the problem, right? Overall, society is going to pay for this, but now it's who pays now versus who pays okay. later, right? And I think that's Fair a little enough. bit of how yeah. I think about this question, you know. And it's obviously a shared model, um, you know, where it kind of tracks where where cash is today. Sort of makes sense. That's what's going to push us forward most quickly. And I think that's some of the piece around the commercial opportunity and the operating companies partnering with equipment vendors. You know, that that fits very well with with that model for me. So there's a, I, I can't let this one go without mentioning it. So there's a comment, it'd be good to form a consortium with member fees to fund the research. Uh, we do have one, it's called Nimble uh, in this space, so I'll just promote that for one second. But we're, we're a public-private partnership, um, co-funded by US government money uh, to do collaborative innovation. And the way we think about it uh, at, at a very high level is, or when we tell organizations that join, if you think about this as, I'm going to put something in, and I want something that I'm going to get out, and I want my slice of the pie, that's understandable. But the real win is when you think about it as, I've got my puzzle piece, and everybody else has their puzzle piece, and we need to work together to, to get those technologies and, and demonstrate them. Uh, that's the space that we live in. Any other uh, comments in response to the uh, who should be doing and who should be paying for innovation. I, I think there's a sense, just kind of looking at some of this input, that uh, shared innovation uh, is really probably the most important path forward and most uh, best opportunity. The last comment is very similar to what I was saying before. So yep. there is these creative thinkers that we need really yes. to uh, take care of. Indeed. Collectively. Wherever they may be, right? It could be at small companies, large companies. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, we've got uh, five minutes left, and uh, we have two options. One is we can keep everyone on track and, and end the panel early, or we can just take a question uh, from the audience, and I'll, uh, I'll make an executive decision that if you want, you can, uh, no, you can't. <laughs> oh, I'm seeing a bunch of questions that have been submitted. Uh, you can't see them on your screen, but I can see them here. Uh, and so I'm just going to look quickly and see if there's a good one that we can uh, try to tackle. Um, okay. Uh, these are reasonably specific, so I'm not sure they're going to make the best question. So why don't you ask what could be the biggest disruption in the coming few years in terms of technological innovation? I okay. Throw, I throw there it you in. Go. Yep. Actually, at least I kick it off. One of the biggest things could be 
the actual step away from uh, ex vivo viral transfection into either electroporation or mechanoporation, and or really the significant affirmation of allogenic that could completely change the paradigm on autologous. That are the two things that might really change the game in the short term. I don't know what the other sees. I think one of the key changes that I'm, that I'm starting to see are just shortening the process. Um, because I think that will ultimately allow for uh, distributed manufacturing uh, and lower cost significantly. So if we can actually make a CAR T or whatever it may be, a viral, non-viral gene therapy within a day or two, um, I think then you know the, everything will change. Um, but the cost will also probably go down significantly. Now I'm absolutely not making any claim on regulatory requirements and uh, liabilities or anything. But just from an innovation perspective, I think that would definitely change the game. Um, for, for me, I think it's economies of scale. You know, we've got some really exciting products like Yaskata, Kimrai on the market, CD19's clearly a validated target. There's a couple of others that are looking good for liquid tumors. Clearly, BCMA is a target where people have lots of hopes as well. But if we really, if the industry settles on a couple of targets that look validated for solid tumors, then I think the uh, economies of scale can really build up. Uh, autologous will also benefit from economies of scale, not, not just uh, allo. So I think a lot of this is going to be driven by the biology and hopefully stunning uh, additions to uh, clinical data sets that really uh, help CAR-T uh, get into solid tumors. Yeah, I, I think I agree with everything that's been said by the, by the panel. The only other one I th think about is really closing the process. And so, you know, kind of reducing the um, kind of the, the burden of manufacture uh, as, a, as a key driver of, of kind of achieving those scales and achieving the potential. It's a bit smaller than some of the others, but I think it has a, a lot of legs uh, going forward. Yeah, I, I agree. I think a better understanding of the biology to be able to predictably, um, so, um, mm. to project the uh, efficacy and the risk uh, profile of some therapeutics are going to be tremendously important and also will help us uh, with better understanding of back, come back into the manufacturing process um, and solve uh, the, the problems, you know, uh, whether it's uh, um, patient based material consistency, uh, what does that do to our process, what does that do to ultimately the efficacy and the risk profile. I think there will be a tremendous breakthrough. Thanks. I, I think it's just a really exciting time to be in this field. I, I think you know, the ability to deliver treatments to patients already in a reasonable and a positive way, um, coupled with the potential opportunities for innovation that are really going to drive the field and grow the field much further, uh, are really exciting. So I want to thank our panelists for making time. I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us uh, today. I believe this is the last session. I think there's uh, lunch after this. So thanks very much for your participation.